All right. Can everyone see this now? Yep, looks yep. good. Okay, great. All right, well, um, thanks for everyone that is uh, here today and welcome for folks that are new to the National Forest. We look forward to working with you. And today we're gonna present the results from uh, 29 years of monitoring efforts within the National Forest System. So just some background information and goals with the project. Um, the monitoring was initiated in uh, 1991 with the goals to gather high quality data to track uh, population trends, assess trends and identify potential concerns, define habitat and landscape associations so forest management uh, can be informed. So this program is complementary to the Breeding Bird Survey and that there these are high density counts that are off-road and specific habitat types. The Breeding Bird Survey will be referenced quite a few times throughout this presentation, and that's a volunteer-based uh, roadside survey that's done throughout um, all or most of North America. The goal is to keep common species common and then focus on species of conservation concern. So this here is a map of all of our survey points throughout the Chippewa and Superior National Forests. Uh, we survey about a little over a thousand point counts per year. Uh, when this project was initiated in 1991, there was roughly 400, a little over 400 points within the Chippewa, a little over 400 points in the Superior. Uh, in 2008, we added 75 points to the Superior National Forest to target uh, black spruce and tamarack uh, habitat types. Uh, initially, when this program got started, there was little uh, pressure to harvest black spruce and tamarack, and then there was uh, more interest in harvesting that in the early 2000s. And so um, folks added, Jerry and, and company added a few more points uh, to the low and conifer cover types there. And then within the Chippewa National Forest uh, in 2016, we added another uh, 75 points to the monitoring program to target early successional habitats, namely uh, young forest and shrubby wetlands with the goal to kind of better monitor uh, golden wing warblers. So between the two, we're serving a little over a thousand points. The way this was set up was um, the points were plotted in a proportionally stratified random design. That means that uh, if 50% of the forest was Aspen, at least around half of our points got put in Aspen cover types. Um, when they set this up, there were three points put into a forest stand, uh, about 16 acres hectares in size or 40 acres in size. In specific habitat types, um, in 2023, we sampled 351 forest stands or 1,028 total uh, point counts. So a little bit about our survey methodology, that figure on the upper left there, that is about a half morning's worth of work for our technicians. Um, there's six or seven point counts there and typically we'll do 10 surveys or 10 to 12 to 15 surveys in the morning with 12 being common. Um, at the very center is our survey points buffered by 100 meter uh, radius circles, kind of gives you an idea of the area that we're generally sampling. Um, and then um, these surveys are 10 minutes long. 90% um, of our detections uh, we hear with our ears. We generally are serving half hour before sunrise to about four hours after sunrise, typically during that month of June and a little bit into July. Um, normally good weather conditions, so low winds and little to no rain. Um, the image there on the right, uh, that's an example of one of what our data sheet looks like. We have basic site info that we fill out at the top. In addition to the bird data that we're collecting, we're also collecting data on red squirrels and chipmunks that are vocalizing during the surveys as well. Um, with our survey there, the individual is at the center of each of those rings. We've got 10, 25, 1500 meter radius uh, circles on the data sheet. And so each technician estimates where they, the bird is relative to them. They always orient, orient themselves northward. And then they give that bird uh, a minute interval in which it was heard during that 10 minute census. And we also do, um, we keep track of individuals that we thought we are hearing from other point counts or other locations. Um, with this, we do three or four day training period in the last week of May there where we are working on distance estimates, species ID, things like that. All of our technicians um, have to have their hearing tested uh, in order to work on this project. And they have to pass 85 birdsong exam um, at an 85% proficiency rate. 
once we get all the data, it's dual entered, error checked, and then we'll run it through the analysis. So the trend analysis, it's a regression-based analysis where we create an annual index of species abundance using the two most distant points per stand. So typically there's three points in the stand and we eliminate that middle point just due to the repeated observations that are, are generally found at that middle point. And then once we get that annual index for each year, we fit a line to that and that line uh, will give us the directions of our, our trends for that species within that national forest. Um, kind of on a, a joking matter here, uh, Todd had mentioned uh, 16 years ago uh, is when he came onto the forest, and it seems like when we have a lot of our declines. <laughs> um, but on a, a serious note here, uh, in uh, 2000 to 2008, we kind of had a peak in the number of birds we were seeing uh, on our point counts. The blue lines there denoted with the Chippewa National Forest, red would be superior, and the regional level is both national forests combined. We did see a decline since that 2005 period uh, going into about 2012 era. And then the last four or five years, we've seen an increase with the number of birds that we're getting on our point counts. Uh, just keep in mind that the last 25 years of surveys that we've been doing, we're still getting a lot more birds or more birds on those surveys than what we did in the 1995, 1996 time periods. And I'll just make a note that um, all the data that we're presenting is based on 1995 forward. Um, the first couple of years of the project, the data is not being used because of the way, the method and way which we were collecting the data. We were collecting only within 100 meters of the observers. And now our surveys are unlimited distance surveys. So everything that we hear gets put on the data sheet, whether it's inside or outside of 100. So everything presented is from 1995 on. So just some trends for the Chippewa National Forest over the last 29 years. Um, 71 species uh, were tested. Um, the surveys that were added in 2016 are not included in uh, in these trend analyses just because they would throw the trends off. But we see 71% um, of the species are stable or increasing and 21 species are um, decreasing out of the 71. And then for the Superior National Forest, um, 67 species met the criteria to be tested for, and 60% or three-fifths of them are either stable or increasing. Um, we are starting to see uh, a few more species decreasing in the Superior versus increasing. And those lowland conifer surveys that were added in 2008, um, we do a separate trend analysis on, on those as well, and I'll present on them here in a little, little bit. And then regionally, when we combine the two national forests, 60 species were tested, and roughly three-fifths of those are either stable um, or increased. Okay, um, some great news here. Uh, these are species that are increasing in both national forests. Um, the BBS column there, that's the second column to the left, that's the volunteer-based survey that I mentioned earlier. Uh, those trends are for BCR Region 12. So that's in a region that encompasses or kind of encloses Lake Superior. So we got Southern Ontario, Northern Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin, and Northern Michigan. And generally what we see with our trends, there's a lot of agreements between our trends and those trends. Species are either non-significant or increasing uh, at that Region 12 level. Uh, the only exception would be Viri here. Uh, the general themes with the species that are increasing, uh, one of the things I'm noting here is that these tend to be conifer associates. Uh, so most of them tend to use some extent of conifer. Um, and then a lot of these are, are long distant migrants. Uh, two species here, the black-throated green warbler and the red-breasted nuthatch are species that, although they are increasing, we are seeing a decline in the last five years in their trends. And so at some point we would expect those species to, to fall out. Okay, so these are species that are decreasing in both national forests. Again, that BBS column there, uh, that second column there. General agreements with our results and their results, a few exceptions are the black-capped chickadee and red-eyed vireo. Um, typically what we're seeing here with species that are declining in both national forests tend to have that conifer component uh, to the vegetation type that they use. 
And then uh, more interestingly, um, a lot of these are short distant migrants or permanent residents that are declining as well. There's a couple species that we're not overly concerned with um, in terms of uh, managing the forest because they're non-forest specialists like common loon, common yellowthroat, and song sparrow. But again, a lot of these are uh, conifer associates and a good chunk of them tend to be low and conifer associates. So these are the decreasing trends uh, for species in the Chippewa National Forest, the Spear National Forest, and at the regional level, we've got significant levels of 0.05 and 0.01. New additions to the Chippewa National Forest are Canada Jay and then White-Breasted Nuthatch. In the Superior National Forest, new additions are Downy Woodpecker and Northern Flicker. Um, the interesting thing to note here is that three of the four uh, newly declining species with the National Forest are um, cavity dependent species. And I'll talk a little bit about that here uh, in a few slides. In a few slides. Um, but the themes with this here that we're seeing is that some of these species are early successional species. Um, a lot of these species have some conifer component to them. And then a good chunk of them um, are cavity dependent uh, species. So these are some species that are of conservation interest, species that pop up on a lot of our conservation lists. The black-billed cuckoo is a species that we generally have a small sample size with within the superior. They are declining in the superior, but increasing in the Chippewa. But the other four species on the list there, Kanaka warbler, olive-side flycatcher, purple finch, and winter wren, are all species that uh, tend to use our low and conifer forests. Um, three of the four are declining, um, with purple finch being the only species uh, at the regional level between the national forests that's increasing. One key difference here between purple finch and the other uh, species is the the, the uh, food resource. So the other three that are declining are generally insectivores, where purple finches tend to rely more on seeds and nuts and things like that. So this is a heat map of some of those uh, species of conservation interest between the Chippewa National Forest and the Superior National Forest. One thing that we typically like to see here within these heat maps is things go from red to green. Um, and we do see uh, quite a bit of that um, with some of these species of conservation interest within the Chippewa National Forest, black Bell cuckoo and Canada warbler seem like they are success stories along with Goldwing warblers, purple finches, berries, and wood thrush. Um, a few species that are kind of trending the, the wrong way uh, within the Chippewa are Kanaka warbler, offside flycatcher, and winter wren. Those are species, again, that are low in conifer associates. And then within the Spear National Forest, a lot of similarities between the Chippewa. Um, the only differences are that um, Goldwing warblers are actually trending downwards in the Superior. That's not super alarming given the fact that they are somewhat uh, kind of out of their, or not out of their range, it just become less common in the, the superior there, and the then superior is more conifer dominated relative to the Chippewa. Uh, but then species like black throat, black throat or blue warbler, Canada warbler, uh, Cape May warbler are successes. Cape May is likely benefiting from the spruce bugworm that we're seeing uh, within the, the national forest, the Spear National Forest. Okay, and this is just a, a table of some of those species of conservation interest and um, some of their migration strategies, nest sites, and vegetation types they use. Um, again, three of the four on this list here tend to be our low and conifer um, associates. Okay, another heat map looking at the different habitat guilds, migration guilds, and nesting guilds between the Chippewa National Forest and the Superior. Uh, starting with the Chippewa National Forest, we are starting to see some of our coniferous forest species uh, trend a little red. Um, and then looking at the migration guilds, our short distant migrants are trending a little red as well. Um, interestingly enough, a good chunk of our short distant migrants tend to use uh, conifer uh, or, or conifer dependent species or conifer associates. Um, so there might be an interaction there. I know they have spruce budworm within the, the Chippewa National Forest which could be an issue. Um, and then when we look at our nesting guilds, our cavity nesting species and the Chippewa are starting to trend a little more red. And then our shrub nesting species are trending red as well. Um, we're not 
overly concerned with our shrub nesting species because those species tend to be early successional species. Some of them are really successional species and we just don't do a ton of harvesting there. Um, and then finally, within the Chippewa, the nest parasitizers, brown-headed cowbirds are um, declining well and that might likely be tied to uh, forest harvesting going on there. Um, within the Superior National Forest, uh, we tend to see our, some of our early successional species declining there and not overly concerned with that. But our coniferous forest species and our mixed forest species are trending, uh, trending in the red. From our right migration standpoint, again, our short distant migrants are uh, trending a little more redder than what we'd want to see. And again, those species tend to have a kind of a component to the habitat that they use. And then in the nesting guilds, uh, probably our biggest concern here is our cavity nesting species within the superior are trending uh, more and more red. Okay, so when we look at some of these guilds more specifically within our early successional guilds, we see regionally declining trends for chestnut-sided warbler, morning warbler, song sparrow, and white-throated sparrow. That BCR Region 12 uh, trend is in parentheses and they generally are in agreement with us. Again, we're not overly concerned with this because it's really easy to create that young forest habitat. And we know the national forests just aren't harvesting a ton. Um, we tend to feel that a lot of these species when you get outside the forest lands are likely uh, benefiting from the amount of harvesting that's going on on state lands and then county lands and some private lands. Um, aerial insectivores are still a, a guild of species that we are concerned with. Um, there's been studies that have come out that have shown that our aerial insects have declined over the last uh, couple decades. Um, but most importantly, four flycatcher species have declining trends in at least one national forest. Um, Yellow-bellied flycatcher um, is kind of a success story. Uh, I believe in the Chippewa, that species is trending up, but most of our flycatcher species are, are trending down. And when we look at that BCR Region 12, um, not just BCR Region 12, but specifically in Minnesota here, a lot of our flycatcher species are significantly declining as well. So this remains a group that we still are keeping a close eye on. Okay, moving into those uh, 75, um, points that we added in 2008 to target, target lowland conifer species. We have approximately 20 lowland conifer, um, lowland conifer species that we did have done trend analysis for. Of those 20 species, um, four species are declining, six species are increasing, and 10 species are stable. Um, of our species of generally of conservation interest, our boreal chickadees, we're getting one to, three, one to five individuals on all of our surveys in the National Forest and with Connecticut warblers the last three years. When we look at all of our point count surveys that have been done, so the 3, 000, over the 3,000 surveys that have been done in the last three years, we only have two detections of Connecticut warblers uh, within National Forest lands. On a positive note, um, blackback woodpeckers, um, the last two years in the monitoring program, we've had the most or the record number of blackback woodpeckers. So in 2022, we had 14 detections. We typically get one to five detections a year. And in 2023, we had 16 detections. And most of those are centered around that, uh, our points that are near that Greenland Lake fire. Um, again, there are still signs, spruce budworm signs. Um, this story is a little more complicated than I wish it was, but uh, basically we've got spruce budworm specialists, so Tennessee warbler, bay-breasted warbler, Cape May warbler that are all trending upwards. And then we have species that like magnolia warbler that use our balsam fir and white spruce forests that are starting to trend downwards. Um, and I say it's a little complicated because we got species like black burning warbler that tends to like to use uh, mature white spruce, uh, white pine, balsam fir forests, and that species is trending up. It's likely that that species is benefiting from the, the budworm itself. And that at some point when that habitat's degraded, we'll see more conifer associates uh, likely declining. Uh, but there are still uh, signals of spruce budworm that we're seeing in our monitoring program. Um, so one of the things that I think our group's trying to get better at doing is sounding the alarm when we think it's necessary. And uh, um, I hope with like species like Connecticut Warbler, it's not too late. Um, but one of the groups or guilds that we're looking to sound the alarm on this year is our woodpecker species. 
So our trends are mixed across the board for our woodpecker species. Some of the trends say that they're significantly increasing. Some say that they're decreasing. Some say they're stable. The one thing I want to point out here with all these graphs, each one of these species here, is that when we look at the last five or ten years, we're trending downwards. And it's not just these three species, but our other woodpecker species that we're detecting with this project are, are trending that direction. So it's something that we're really concerned about. Um, we're really perplexed about too, because we we know that the folks within the National Forest are doing minimal harvesting. Um, and so we're kind of uh, perplexed why that we'd be seeing this trend here. In addition to that, um, trends from like the, the BBS from the regional level and state level are showing that these species are doing okay in this region. And so there's some disagreements between those trends and, and our trends. But nonetheless, uh, like I said, if you look at the last five or 10 years, we are not trending in the right direction for these species. And then when we look at some of our permanent residents, most of our permanent residents are declining along with our secondary nesters. So our secondary cavity nesters are um, species that are depending on those primary cavity excavators to make their, their homes. So species like black cap chickadee and white-breasted nuthatch and red-breasted nuthatch are all trending downwards last five or, or 10 years or so. And then looking at the Goldwing Warbler surveys that were added in 2016, uh, Goldwing Warblers and the Chippewa are doing really well. Um, we know there's been a lot of management for that species uh, in this state. So it's likely benefiting from that management there. The trend we're seeing in the, the Superior National Forest for Goldwing Warblers we're not overly concerned with. We know that folks within the National Forest are, are generally doing minimal harvest. Um, but when we look at the, the species results from those monitoring efforts and those 75 points, Goldwing warblers are coming up around the 10th most common species in those stands, and they're occupying roughly two-thirds of the 25 stands that we are surveying. Uh, most common species in those sites are ovenbird, red-eyed vireo, and viri. Okay, probably one of the bigger uh, take-home slides here, take uh, messages is that um, this uh, uh, chart here just uh, shows the number of species that are increasing, decreasing, and stable the last 10 to 12 years uh, within the National Forest. Um, and the one thing that we continue to see is that the number of species that are decreasing is going up each year. Um, some of that can be a little nuanced with some of our non-forest dependent species. Uh, uh, popping into that list, uh, but generally each year we're seeing more and more forest-dependent species uh, decline. So these next couple graphs here are just results from that uh, chart I just showed. Again, we see more species decreasing each year within the Chippewa National Forest. Um, the number of species that are stable has remained relatively stable. Um, but again, that trend of decreasing species continues to go up each year. Um, in the Spear National Forest, the number of species that are increasing remains relatively stable, and the number of species that are stable are coming down, and the number of species that are decreasing are trending up. And then similar trends at the regional level as well. Okay, as we close down uh, our results here, um, you know, We've got larch beetle impacting a lot of tamarack um, throughout the state. The image on the right there is uh, our updated uh, EAB map of EAB infested areas within the state. Um, folks within the Chippewa National Forest are probably well aware of uh, EAB there now. Um, it's likely, uh, you know, in the next 5 to 10, 15 years, we're going to see a big shift of species moving from these uh, wet forests into areas that haven't likely been impacted yet. So one of the examples that I'm pulling out here is northern water thrush. It's a species that's dependent on black ash and tamarack forests, and we're seeing an increase within our national forest. So it's possible that that species has moved out of those areas that have been impacted by EAB and ELB and moved into our national forests. Um, generally speaking, though, our national forests represent the best case scenario uh, for birds in our state. We know that you folks are harvesting minimally within the state. Um, and then for our mature forest species, we'd expect these results not to be as promising when we look at state lands and uh, other areas where the, the harvests are a little more intensive. 
So just some thoughts here, not every species can increase. Um, hopefully not everything will decrease as well, but species are indicators of change on the ground. Uh, we see that in our spruce budworm specialists. Those species are really benefiting from the spruce, spruce budworm outbreak. Um, when we look at some of our conifer dependent species are likely being impacted by uh, spruce budworm. Um, Minnesota is very unique in that a lot of these species are at the edge of their range. We got more of our boreal species are that are at the southern edge of their range. And we've got a lot of um, uh, species that are at the northern edge of their range. And so we'd be fools not to think that we're going to see species increase and decrease being at the southern and northern edges of the their ranges. But, um, you know, when these species migrate here and with our resin species, Minnesota is the only place for those birds when they're here that we can add more birds to the population. So it's very important that we have uh, quality uh, breeding habitat on the landscape and not just quality breeding habitat, but quanti good quantities of quality breeding habitat on the landscape. And our forests are constantly changing. There's likely local and landscape scale changes to forest age class distributions that are probably affecting many of these uh, species. Um, trying to tease apart, you know, we've got 70 or so species that we're presenting on. I wish we could come up with a silver bullet for a lot of these species, but these things are very complex. Um, some, no doubt, some of these species are dealing with issues on their on their migration or their their wintering grounds. You know, when species are migrating here, we've got more and more uh, cell towers popping up, wind turbines, things like that that they have to encounter. But the reality is, is that some of our permanent residents are declining as well, which points to potential issues here um, on the breeding grounds. In summary, uh, most species tend to be doing okay. Uh, trends at this scale are more informative for management and conservation when compared to uh, some of our larger scale BBS results. Um, the, ability, the fact that we have, uh, we can separate the national forests and look at species um, in a more detailed manner between those national forests gives us confidence that we can move forward and, um, you know, give you folks the right ammunition to use in terms of managing and conserving those species. Um, this monitoring project is foundational for guiding our lab. I believe the majority of our projects um, that we have have revolved or come out of this project here. When we see a species that is declining, we can go uh, to our legislature and um, hopefully get funding to help that species or conserve that species. Ultimately, our goal is to, to conserve biodiversity, so our old growth mature forest species still remain a concern. Most notably, our cavity nesting species are species that we're really trying to keep an eye on now. Um, we do have a LCCMR funded pileated woodpecker research project that's starting up in July, so we're hoping to learn more about what those woodpeckers, not just pileated, but other woodpeckers uh, uh, need uh, in a given landscape. Bull and conifer species tend still tend to remain a, a big concern. Connecticut warblers have one of the most consistent declines of any species uh, since 1995. Um, it's a low and conifer uh, associate. Um, boreal chickadees still we still have relatively low numbers of them, and then species like winter wren. Um, it's a low and conifer associate too that is is not doing super super well. Our short distance migrants uh, remain a concern. Um, so our short distance migrants uh, tend to, to be, have that conifer component in terms of the habitat they use. It's not well known how much truly uh, spruce budworm is impacting that. A lot of our short distance migrants, we saw the snowstorm that just come in here. Um, we don't have a lot of short distance migrants back yet, but when we get these um, weather events here in April and in May, that's not great. Uh, early May, that's not great for a lot of our short distance migrants. So that could be impacting some of those species, um, a, a few years ago, I presented on that deep freeze that Texas had back in February, where that literally knocked out, you know, a third, at least 30% of our bluebirds. Um, and then there's a lot of species like yellow rumped warbler, hermit thrush, and things like that that were impacted by that that system as well. And then finally, um, our roles here at NRI are, I wouldn't say evolving, but um, one of the things I think our group is trying to be better at is to, um, instead of putting this stuff on a shelf somewhere where it's, you know, maybe it'll get looked at, maybe it won't. We're trying to be better about, you know, when we see these species declining, um, offering up conservation solutions and, and pushing these solutions. 
Um, an example is the experimental cuts with Connecticut warblers. We've seen that species is declining. We know what that species needs um, from a habitat standpoint, and it's our job to start pushing these uh, conservation solutions for these species. And we're we're trying to be better about that. And uh, anyways, at least I think we are. Okay, with that said, I can take any questions uh, that folks may may have. Awesome, thanks, Josh. Uh, any questions? Um, I do have a question, Josh. This is Sharon Furland. Um, you pointed out that downy woodpeckers are declining. Um, I'm wondering about Harry's. So the, it doesn't seem like those are showing up as a declining species. Is there something significant, significantly different about the biology of those two species that would make that such a difference? Yeah, and I I would have to double check my notes, but I thought the last and, and so, so just to back up, so our trends are still showing that some of these species are increasing, but the thing I'm pointing out is that the last five or ten years they're declining. I want to say with Harry there was some sort of similar trend to Downey in that they were uh, trending that similar direction, um, but in terms of uh, differences in what they use, um, I'm not really uh, don't have a really great answer answer there um and so i hope with this woodpecker study we have coming up here we can learn at least a little bit something more about the differences for both of those species and then all the species as well i don't know steve or alexis you guys have any thoughts i don't um it is one of those things that we're hoping to learn more about in terms of cavity kind of survival and what the sizes of the cavities are and just even the different tree species that they're using we don't have a great handle on that and it's a really cool place to learn about woodpeckers because there are so many woodpecker species here um mike north has a study that he's been doing with a grad student at bemidji state that started to look at it but they don't have a huge sample size um in general quite yet so it'll be interesting to to sort of unravel that mystery um, so yeah sorry sharon that's not super helpful but we hope to learn more ask us like right. next year or the year after <laughs> um no, that's chris. helpful thanks okay great <laughs> chris feel yeah i love this data set uh, every year the, there's just so many interesting questions that it that it gets us going on and thinking about conservation and how these different species interact. So yeah, I look forward to this presentation every year. Um, the one thing uh, that, so the woodpecker trends are really fascinating. I'm glad you're doing a study on that. The one thing that sprung to mind, and you said this, Josh, is that we do minimal harvesting kind of on the landscape scale. But the thing that I immediately thought was that's not true for one specific forest type, aspen. We hit our aspen really hard. So the aspen that we don't hit is aging out. It's it's all old stuff that's that's falling over. And by old, I mean like 120, 130 years. Like foresters really have this idea about the mean age of aspen. And in their mind, it all falls over at age like 100. But actually, that's not true. Like, you know, it's 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 on a tail. And so if you if you have, a, you know, a, a, a normal period of disturbances, you're going to have a lot of areas where there are big old aspen that are still on the landscape. And I feel like we are cutting it at these early rotations and then it's falling over the high rotations. And so I, I like immediately I'm like that that is such a, an important cavity forming tree that I, I wonder if, if the, the loss of mature aspen in the landscape, because we cut it soon and then the old stuff we've left to fall over. That immediately is the gap that occurs to me, but I'll be excited yeah. to hear what your study is. Yeah, so one of our intents with Alexis's study here is that we do want to go to areas where we know there is intensive harvesting in areas where that aspen is aging to see what, you know, for example, how far are pileated woodpeckers having to travel to forage in those given landscapes? And not just those, you know, we're going to make notes of other species as well. So we are, in addition to you, we are super excited for that study to, to get going here. Yeah, Chris, that's a great point. And actually, our um, woodpecker study is focused on the aspen cover type for those exact reasons. So I'm uh, really excited that you're excited about it, too. And we'll be looking for study areas um, across different ownership types with different like sort of management intensities and so I might be reaching out actually I'm not I will be reaching out to you for maybe some assistance helping sort of think about what that might look like and where they, those areas might be 
Yep, very cool. Always glad to help in any little way I can. Great. Any other questions? Don't really All have right. A, oh, oh, go ahead, Reed. Sorry, sorry. Alexis. I don't, I don't really have a question, more of a statement, but you know, along those similar lines, um, you know, with that with the uh increased uh limelight on the bat, you know, being listed and, and uh us kind of shifting our um management approaches to snags when it comes to harvest. You know, one thing that's that we were currently doing now that's uh more in line with the bat conservation strategy is essentially unless it's a a, a hazard snag out in a uh, out in the stand, I mean we're leaving all of that on the landscape um under the BCS conservation measures. So I'm kind of interested to see how that's gonna you know impact um, that question as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's a great, that's interesting context. Um, awesome. So I guess maybe when we get the, finally get the money in for that, um, having a small meeting and just sort of thinking about this really comprehensively. Um, so Ron, Moen and Michael Joyce, the, who are the mammal side of um, the Wildlife Ecology Lab are also involved with the Woodpecker Project in terms of looking at different um, cavity uses and and that sort of thing. So we hope to have it really focus on pileateds, get all idea of all sorts of different primary and secondary cavity nesters or users, dwellers, I think is the term that I use. So that'll be great to like sit down and just kind of think about what kind of data would be most useful to you guys as we start that project. Hey, Alexis, uh, Todd here. So I guess more of a comment, um, you know, here on the chip, we're kind of at a crossroads with uh, changes to our veg types. You know, we've got spruce decline in just huge, I mean, huge landscapes on the forest. Um, the world as we know it from a spruce habitat standpoint is going away. Um, tamarack decline. Um, and now we've got EAB. Um, so, you know, there's there's going to be a change in forest types occurring here on the forest. Um uh, and we're being, we're just, we're trying to be proactive, but in the meantime, we're being reactive to it. So again, something to keep in mind, you know, while we talk about this, uh, about all this uh, monitoring going on that, uh, you know, one of the key contributors to some of this could be some of these changes in veg types moving, moving forward. And again, trying to determine what that, uh, what the consequence of that is. Um, I think that'll be the million dollar question knowing that um, some of these spruce stands may be converted to aspen. I mean, it's just the way it is. So anyway, some pretty dramatic changes here are happening on the chip. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll touch a little bit more on how we're kind of studying that in these different habitat types too after um, after the break. And it'll be interesting to hear. Todd, have you guys developed like an assist assisted migration plan? I know the Superior has been working on it. Um, are, do, you, are you, do you guys have like a policy on that or how you guys are approaching assisted migration? Um, good question. I don't, I don't know. Uh, does uh, Reed or anybody on the chip have any insight into that? Um, I don't, not to my knowledge, I don't think we have a, like a, you know, an actual plan in place. I know assisted migration is, you know, a, a hot talking point, um, but I, I don't, I don't think there's any um, plan on how we're going to incorporate that stuff. I do know that, um, you know, in, in, especially with EAB, because EAB, it was now found on, on, in my district that, um, assisted migration was incorporated into, uh, replanting some of these ash areas that we're going to hit pretty hard with harvest and, and one of them being swamp white oak. Um, so, um, I, I think, aspects of it are being incorporated and being thought of but i don't i, I don't know or at least I, it hasn't been made aware to me that there there's a an actual legitimate plan in place great thanks for the information um any other questions about the annual trend overview i got a real simple one um when, uh, with your guys' uh, lowland conifer study that you guys got going up by Red Lake, uh, when when do you guys see some results coming out of that? Oh, buddy, just a couple of minutes, you'll see some, some, oh, nice. some of those right, awesome. um, Yeah, so we'll talk about those. Um, 
yeah, uh, sort of, uh, we have three talks centering, centering around those, some of those results, but the study is ongoing too. So uh, in the next few years, I think we'll have a huge data set. So stay tuned and then we can ask more questions about that. Perfect, thank you. Um, Awesome. Well, then we'll transition to the nerd of the day, who is Steve Colby, who's going to talk about some really <laughs> nerdy modeling um, things that we're doing with this data set um, with one of our um, friends, Neil Gilbert, who is a postdoc from Michigan State. And we recently submitted this paper to the Journal of Animal Ecology. Um, but it's a really cool, I think, um, approach to... Or, like sort of way, I guess, to use this data because of the unique area and where we are and on all the different kind of biodiversity. And just like Todd mentioned, we're seeing these vegetation shifts and how can we sort of help predict what might be happening with some of the bird species and, and just kind of get a better handle as climate um, changes are taking place in our forests. So I'll hand it off to Steve Colby. Have fun. All right. Thanks, Alexis. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. See if I can figure out how to advance the slides. All right. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So this is um, <clears throat> a project that was undertaken by Neil Gilbert. He's at Michigan State University. He's a postdoc there. Um, Neil was going to present, but then he went to Columbia and uh, is watching a bunch of uh, black burning warblers and Canada warblers and black and white warblers and so on and so forth uh, that winter down there along with all the other cool stuff that's down there. Uh, and then he left... Uh, me with the task of presenting the, uh, these results. So <clears throat> hope you don't mind that. But basically, uh, you know, Neil had a lot of the same reaction as Chris did when he heard, what do you mean you have a 29 year data set for a thousand point counts in Northern Minnesota? We can do some cool stuff with that. And this is uh, what he came up with. And so he was interested in um, using these population trends that we are developing and trying to relate them with the structure of a species range. And maybe if we can predict which species are going to react certain ways based on those, uh, those structures in their range. Okay, we want the ability to understand and predict which species are more likely to shift their range. That sounds like a good goal. So let's pursue that. Okay, so as you just heard Josh talking about in his first presentation there, um, we think about this a lot and we group birds into all sorts of different guilds or if they nest on the ground or if they are long distance migrants or if they eat insects only or whatever. And it turns out that things are complicated and there's a lot of different uh, ways that we can parse this data. And sometimes we have weak or mixed ability to predict trends or uh, by proxy range shifts. Sometimes something like, you know, people have looked at this in the past, you know, larger birds often uh, might be able to shift the range better. Maybe birds that are uh, more migratory than like a bird that's just sitting around like a grouse or something like that would be more likely to shift its range. Maybe a bird that's like more of an omnivore could be a uh, easier uh, range shifter than something that's a really specialist like an aerial insectivore, but it's, but it's complicated. And so Neil and, and we were, wondering, well, maybe we can look at the sort of the externalities of a species range and see if something in there could help us predict what we're seeing uh, with all of these uh, trends that were documented in the national forest. So in particular, what we're interested in, this hasn't really been studied before, is the range edge texture. So basically, how does uh, the abundance of a species at its range edge uh, influence the population trends and as a result, uh, potential shifts that we may be seeing in its range. And as Josh mentioned, we have an amazing data set for this, not only because it's 29 years long, but because we are at an intersection of so many species ranges. Uh, you'll see in a minute that there are 53 species that we were able to run our analysis on and all 53 of those species have a range edge within 100 kilometers of one of our point count sites. That's mind blowing. I don't think there's very many places in the continent that would be able to say that we have that many species that close to an edge. And so we are perfectly situated to answer some of these questions. And so this is what we're talking about with range edge texture. So if you're there, hypothetically, you're this maroon dot you have a species range on the left there where it's really diffuse and maybe it's 
the abundance of that species is more centered in the middle of the range. Uh, that would be sort of like a, a soft edge, we would call that. Uh, but on the right, uh, if you have really high abundance of species right up to the edge, we would call that a hard edge. That's going to be important. But we have some, we have some uh, examples here on the next couple slides. So here's a pileated woodpecker that has a hard, warm edge. Uh, so you can see on the southern edge of its range there, uh, it just stops. Like it's super bright purple, which is the uh, abundance. So these are all eBird relative abundance maps. And so what eBird did, of course, is collected a bunch of uh, uh, citizen science observations, millions and millions of checklists. And they did some real fancy modeling with land cover and various other things and produced these abundance maps. And the darker the color, the more uh, abundant the bird is in those areas. So Pilly Woodpecker here on the the warm edge of its range or the south end of its range, it, it is very abundant and then it just stops. And so some of that you can see, of course, is the Gulf of Mexico, but all, some of it isn't, right? It just stops right in uh, the middle of the uh, upper uh, coast of Texas. Chestnut side warbler is sort of the uh, inverse of that, they have a, a soft warm edge or a soft trailing edge to their range. So you can see that the, the red color slowly, slowly fades to pink and then nothing. And so it's not nearly as abrupt on the south end or the warm edge. Wilson's warbler is a good example of a bird that has a hard cold edge. Uh, so really abundant and then it just stops. And so you can see, you know, some areas that's the James Bay, Hudson Bay area. In other areas, it's tree line. So they just stop. And then the sort of opposite of that is a morning dove here. You can see it's a very diffuse uh, cold edge, a soft edge. So it is slowly, slowly fading in uh, relative abundance. Okay, so uh, this is where things get a little bit conceptual. But we, uh, <clears throat> when we were thinking about what could possibly be happening with these uh, population trends and thinking about the structure of the abundance uh, and the texture within a species range, we came up with two different hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the dispersal hypothesis. And so basically that focuses on a bird species ability to move, uh, maybe move uh, north uh, with the uh, you know, potential climate change, a lot of things are predicted to go north, so, uh, or to recede north on the, on the trailing edge. The limitation hypothesis doesn't really think about bird movement as much as it does, thinks about things that are inhibiting that bird's movement, that species' ability to move. So maybe there is a geographic barrier, you know, like the Gulf of Mexico or uh, James Bay, Hudson Bay or whatever, but we don't really have those here. And so like things that could be limiting species are, you know, like, maybe a species is a deciduous forest species and it's bumping up on a bunch of spruce fir forests and that's not gonna work out so well. And so it's easier to think about this if you think about species. So on the right there, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse, but on the right here, uh, top right, you see a trailing edge species. And so we can think about that as something like say, Connecticut warbler, boreal chickadee, spruce grouse, uh, alder flycatcher, all of those traditional like you know, Canadian shield uh, boreal forest breeders. They're on their southern edge, their trailing edge here uh, in northern Minnesota. The dispersal hypothesis would posit that as range hardness increases, so you can see on the bottom, uh, that sort of the x-axis, the ultimate x-axis here at the bottom, as range hardness increases, so as abundance increases on that trailing edge, of the range. So there's a lot of that species right at the southern edge of its range here in Minnesota. The As that uh, range gets harder, the population uh, trend would be uh, declining less rapidly. And so the thought behind that is that there's a lot of individuals at the southern edge of the range, and there's a lot of sort of like inertia. And so even if birds are slowly moving north out of the range there's still a lot of population there and so as a result the ultimate um, uh, trend would be dec declining more slowly if you think about the trailing edge species at the limitation hypothesis it's the opposite so as range ed hard edge hardness increases so you still have a ton of, of of abundance at the southern edge of the range then the limitation hypothesis says that the population trend would 
in or decrease even uh, more more rapidly. And so the thought behind that is that there's something at the southern edge that's limiting their ability to remain there. And so it's literally pushing them out of that area. So if you think about that same same concept, but think about it for uh, species like wood thrush or uh, yellow-throated vireo uh, or red red blade woodpecker, some some species that is that is uh, you know colonizing, moving north. It's a little bit different. So the dispersal hypothesis would predict that if you have a lot of birds right on that leading edge, that you're going to have a lot more individuals that can uh, colonize new areas and colonize faster. And as a result, your population trend would increase faster. Now, the limitation hypothesis would say that despite the fact that you have lots of uh, birds on that leading edge, you have a really hard leading edge. The limitation hypothesis would say that your population trend is increasing less quickly because despite the fact you have a lot of birds there, there's something that is blocking them, right? So it's either uh, maybe like the the soil type or the vegetation type, or uh, maybe there's a competitor or something uh, like that that is literally blocking them um, from, um, from moving north in this case. All right, everybody with me? Hope so. Okay. So to go about doing this, what we did was we downloaded all of this uh, relative abundance data from eBird, amazing data set as well. And so the whole range was downloaded for a species. Within that range, we extracted the, the average uh, annual temperature in each one of the little grids, and then clipped that to the warmest 10% and the coldest 10%. So we got the, the, the warm edge and the cold edge of the range. And then we filled in that clipped area with the abundance from eBird. And then we were able to calculate the edge hardness, so whether it's a hard edge or a soft edge, by calculating the mean abundance within the edge compared to or divided by the abundance across the entire range. So you can, this is just kind of a fun figure to see all the species that we were able to look at. And so if you are quick, you can look there and, and find your favorite species and see what its deal is, but you can see the population trends there that Josh has uh, presented on, on the x-axis, and you can see the 35 trailing edge species, so those are mostly boreal forest species that are on the southern edge of the range, and then you can see the 18 leading edge species that um, are on the northern edge of the range, and you can see that the temperature indexes like the overall like uh, coldness or warmness of that species range uh, throughout its range. So some really interesting patterns there. And after Neil did some fancy modeling that I won't and can't get into, um, you can talk to him at any point if you'd like, or you can email me and I'll get in touch with him for you. Um, we found some interesting results. Uh, the we found some uh, moderate support for the limitation hypothesis because trailing edge species with harder ranges were more likely to be declining. So that makes sense, right? So, uh, you know, for example, um, a trailing edge species with a hard range, Connecticut warbler, there's a lot of, of Connecticut warblers right on the southern edge of the range. And we are seeing a really steep decline as you, as you saw from Josh's presentation. And so, what we're what that may, maybe means is that they are being literally pushed out, pushed up and out of the area by some sort of abiotic or biotic factor in the environment. So it's not necessarily their inability to move as a species, but they are literally being forced to move. And then leading edge species, so the species like wood thrush, yellow throat of et cetera, with hard range edges were slightly more likely to be increasing. And so we had a little bit of weak support for the dispersal hypothesis. And so maybe the one that makes a little more intuitive sense, we had a little less support for than the one that is a little uh, more nebulous. So that, that's a really interesting result. And why is any of this important? Well, <clears throat> we need to understand why species are able or unable to shift their range in the face of climate change. And we want to know which of the species are going to have the largest challenges in doing this. And if we were able to find these answers, we would really be able to target 
Um, a, lot, a lot of like things like Josh was saying, we were able to target what we really want to focus on, focus our research on, focus our conservation efforts on, and all of our deliverables that we can give to land managers and so on and so forth. And can't stress this enough, we are in the perfect place to be studying this and we can really act as an early warning system for a lot of the boreal forest as so many of the species that uh, breed in North America are coming from, you know, the, the boreal forest is like the nursery for, for birds. Uh, and so we can act as this early warning system for a lot of that area and say, hey, we think that you should focus on species X and Y because they are really seeming to have an issue with being able to adapt to this rapidly changing world and maybe species Z uh, is, go is going to have a little easier uh, go of it. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, leave you for now, um, but I'm happy to field some questions. Awesome, thank you, Steve. Yeah, any questions about the range shift dynamics? Not seeing any. I think one of the um, big takeaways for me from that paper is just how many are, um, how many of those species are quantitatively going to be shifting north and uh, how few that are currently here are actually coming in or, or sort of on that leading edge. And thinking about that and what that potentially means for our overall biodiversity of breeding birds in the forest, you know, 20, 50 years from now um, is maybe concerning um, and something that I hadn't necessarily um, put together, how, how different it is, 35 to 18, is that what it is? Um, so anyways, I think it's a really great example of how we can use this really cool data set and hopefully there's more to come um, with our fancy modeling efforts in the future. All right. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, Reed and Josh are going to talk about our Hunter Walking Trails uh, project in the Chippewa National Forest. And so, Reed, you're going to go ahead and share. Yeah, just a second here. Awesome. Can you guys see that? Yeah, looks great. Okay, sweet. Um, I'll hand it over to Josh to do the intro, but I'll um, be hopping on for the methods and the results here in a few minutes. Thank you. All righty, folks. Okay, so um, we've got the Chippewa National Forest Hunter Walking Trail Project uh, 2024 updates. Uh, we're going, we've had four years of uh, collecting data on this project. Uh, this project was initiated by uh, folks within the Chippewa National Forest uh, with partnership through uh, RGS. Okay, a little bit about, about Rough Grouse 101. Um, so in Minnesota, Rough Grouse are uh, found statewide except for the southwest part of the state, generally in our forested areas. Uh, Minnesota ranks top three for, for harvest. Um, based on Minnesota DNR data, the Rough Grouse population cycle every 10 years with the range being eight to 11 years. Generally, they require a matrix of multiple age forests, so young forest and older forest or more mature forests on the, the landscape. Um, in recent years, but there's been some concern over West Nile, um, but more importantly, there's been uh, some concern over hunter uh, participation, declining hunter participation, and some of the thoughts with a project like this or you know, maybe we could potentially improve rough grouse habitat to improve that hunter uh, retention uh, problem that we're seeing. So rough grouse management, uh, so in 2011, Minnesota Dinner put out a long range plan for rough grouse. And it's basically uh, aimed at uh, increasing young forest stands on the landscape for rough grouse. Uh, Gordy Gillian and his work done in the early eighties uh, basically noted that uh, classic grouse habitat consists of a close juxtaposition of multiple age classes of aspen and relatively small patches on the landscape. So our questions with this project are what effects do timber management decisions about individual aspen stands have on rough grouse habitat and breeding bird populations in Minnesota? 
So our objectives with this project are to, are to assess rough grouse abundance and characterize breeding bird communities before and after harvest treatments are implemented, quantify the changes in rough grouse abundance and breeding bird communities after the harvest, and then summarize our findings and uh, provide them to the folks within the, the National Forest. So this is the Minnesota uh, DNR rough grouse survey. We can see that rough grouse are cycle uh, every few years. Um, the last couple of years have been relatively good uh, years for rough grouse here in the state. <clears throat> okay, a little bit about our study design. Um, initially, when we started, we had four sites that we were working in the original four core areas, Carter Lake, Morph Meadows, Tower Lake, and Webster Lake. In 2023, um, we knew we had to add a few more sites for a couple of reasons. Um, Johnson Lake was being managed similarly to the four core areas. So that was added or incorporated into the, the study design. But we wanted to add three more sites in. Um, the three sites that we added were North Winnie, Sugar Lake, and Mud Lake as controls. The reason we wanted to add these sites in is that uh, these sites had various forms of management. So for example, North Winnie has relatively little management compared to the other two sites. And Sugar Lake and Mud Lake have more intensive management going on in the landscape. So we need these sites to compare our five core area sites to, to really tease apart some of these differences that we're seeing with these um, small harvests that we're doing. And this is an example of our morph metal site. Um, so the uh, stands or the polygons in orange there uh, denote small two to five acre uh, cuts. These are aspen harvests, um, maybe some mixed wood in there, but generally aspen dominated. Um, they recently were cut here uh, the last few winters. And then the stands that are in yellow are set to be cut five years after the date when the stands in orange were cut. So we've got um, small cuts along these hunter walking trails and they're they're happening at more frequent intervals. So the hopes is to improve breeding bird habitat and rough grouse habitat with these smaller cuts. Some sites like Webster Lake have uh, green polygons, which are spruce for uh, stands that are being uh, that are being thinned. Sweet. Okay. Thanks for that intro, Josh. Um, I'll start by briefly going over our two survey methods that we use for the study uh, before diving into some results from the first four years. Um, so our first monitoring method that we use is line transect surveys, which we conduct twice a year at each of the hunter walking trails. Uh, so basically our trained observers will walk the entirety of each trail early in the morning, I think a half hour before sunrise we start and we'll record the locations of every bird that we hear or see either on a data sheet or on an iPad. And if this sounds fun, it really is. Um, anytime we're able to survey from trails instead of bushwhacking is pretty delightful. Um, plus listening to a lot of cool birds is always fun. Uh, we conduct the first round of surveys in the springtime, uh, usually late April or early May, depending on how the winter is going and the migration is going. And um, these spring surveys are focused mostly on rough grouse activity, while the goal of the second round of surveys in June is to assess breeding bird communities. And we've been conducting these transect surveys since 2020 before any harvesting occurred. So um, at this point, we have four years worth of data and hopefully that'll continue. So for our second survey method we use, um, we use autonomous recording units, uh, henceforth known as ARUs, seen in the picture on the right there. In 2023, we placed 24 ARUs throughout our eight hunter walking trails. And we deployed these during our first transect surveys in springtime and left them out uh, for the entire month of May and we picked them up um, in late June. Uh, all these units are programmed to record one hour of audio at sunrise and one hour at sunset every day. So by the end of summer, we're left with just a massive library of audio files to, to dive into. And these recordings provide presence absence data for several species of interest, uh, specifically rough grouse and American woodcock, but um, also songbirds and amphibians in the future.
So at our four original hunter wild control sites that we've been monitoring since 2020, um, the initial round of harvesting has been completed at all four. Um, at the Morph Meadows and Tower Lake sites, um, they were harvested in the winter of 21 and 22. Um, so summer of 22 would be the first year that we are seeing um, harvest results at those sites. Uh, Carter Lake was cut in the winter of 22, 23. And uh, some weird stuff happened at Webster Lake. The initial harvest was partially completed in 2021, and the remainder was harvested in the winter of uh, 22 and 23. And uh, finally, you see Johnson Lake on the bottom there. That's one of the recently added sites. Um, it hasn't been harvested as of yet. I believe it was scheduled for this past winter. So um, more to come on that. Hey, Reed, I think uh, Johnson Lake should be done. Uh, okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, but I think everything's done. Yeah, I was just going to put that in the notes. The first the first entry has been completed. Okay, well, that's awesome. All right, now as we start to look at some of the results from the original four sites uh, over the four years, uh, this table takes a look at the rough grouse abundance during our spring transect surveys, uh, shown as observations per 100 meters of the trail. Uh, those red lines you see on the table represent when the site was harvested. Uh, those dotted lines on Webster Lake represent those two partial harvests um, seen on the previous slide. So looking at just the 2023 data, we can see that Morph Meadows had the highest grouse density and was the only site that actually saw an increase in grouse abundance from 2022. These are our four trails again uh, that we saw on the last slide during each of the past four survey years. Um, might be a little hard to see, but each of those yellow dots represents a different drumming rough grouse that our observers detected and plotted during the spring transect surveys while walking on the trails, which are shown in purple. And those uh, kind of yellowish shaded stands uh, that you start to see popping up in 2022, 2023 are um, the harvested cuts or the harvested stands. So you can see kind of where the grouse are hanging out in relation to those cuts so far. All right, here's some more kind of raw data from those same four sites. Um, first looking at just grouse and woodcock from our transect surveys. Um, during the spring surveys, we detected a total of 46 drumming grouse at the four main sites and zero woodcock. Uh, when comparing years, it looks like grouse numbers are down a little from 2022, but increased when you compare them to pre-harvest numbers. Uh, also, we detected an average of around 215 birds per survey site of 52 species during those early spring surveys. Uh, however, this time of year in the spring, those are mostly resident species and short distance migrants that are just uh, moving through the area. So um, our emphasis for breeding birds is more in our summer surveys. Now, taking a look at those uh, summer surveys I just mentioned uh, that we did in early June, which are more fo focused on breeding bird communities. We detected 640 individual birds per hunter walking trail which as you can see has definitely been trending upwards since the small scale harvesting began. And of those birds, we saw 70 different species. And again, uh, these summer surveys aren't really aimed at grouse, but we did record 10 drumming individuals last year. Right, looking more at the the summer data. This table show or this table shows some bird species that have been responding uh, so far to our harvest methods. You can see oven birds and red-eyed vireos, which are commonly associated with mature forests, surprisingly shown um, a little bit of an increase um, in abundance post-harvest, which is caused a little bit by surprise. But um, this is a trend that we've been seeing with most species that. Um, we're getting more birds and um, more diverse species since the small scale harvests have started. And then looking down at Viri and Least Flycatcher and Golden Wing Warbler, uh, those are all species of conservation concern that are seemingly responding super well to these uh, small scale cuts. 
And uh, this is especially important for golden-winged warblers, which depend on a diverse matrix of forest age, especially early successional habitats that these uh, small scale cuts are creating for them. So we're kind of expecting those numbers to keep increasing in the future as those uh, Aspen regen stands start to mature a little bit into early successional. Okay, so that's about it for the transect surveys for now. Let's jump into the ARUs uh, for our second survey method. In 2023, we detected grouse in all eight project areas from our ARUs and on each day that the ARUs were deployed. Uh, the ARUs collected 6,234 grouse drums, which is kind of unbelievable, on almost 1,000 hours of total audio recordings throughout that month of May. Um, that figure on the bottom shows what the rough grass drums look like from our audio files. Um, I think there's 10 or 11 drums you can actually kind of pick out on that spectrograph. And they're, um, the nature of rough grass drums, they're um, very low frequency, so it's possible to detect them pretty easily with finders, which Steve Colby is definitely an expert on if you have questions about that. These are the results from the ARU recordings at the four original sites, kind of similar to that uh, table I showed earlier, those red lines representing major harvesting events at the four hunter walking trails. So based on our ARUs, the rough grouse index actually went down at all four sites in 2023, which is somewhat surprising when looking at the DNR's annual grouse survey. Uh, they saw an increase in drums in Minnesota However, the Northwest region uh, where these sites are located did see a slight decline in total drums. But this could also be due to less than ideal grouse habitat in the first couple of years following these small scale harvests. But this will quickly turn into really great habitat in the years to come, which is why the long term nature of this study is uh, really cool and valuable. Uh, this basically shows what you saw on the last slide in graph form. Uh, you can see the average drums per hour at each site during the four survey years, as well as uh, how the new four sites compare that were added last year on the right there. And again, it's worth noting that this is a long-term study, so the full scope of the changes associated with uh, these small scale cuts will be revealed in the coming years as we continue to monitor. So just looking back at our two main survey methods, here's a quick comparison between them and what they're showing us. Uh, the left column there shows uh, the grass observed per 100 meters during our transect surveys. And on the right is uh, the frequency at which grass are drumming from our ARUs. Um, when you compare the two, uh, somewhat similar morph meadows had the highest abundance of um, grouse on our sur transect surveys and more grouse drum detections. And also Webster Lake and Carter Lake tended to be on the lower side for both of these methods. So um, it just goes to show that these two methods appear to be in agreement and complement each other pretty well for a comprehensive rough grass assessment. And finally here, we took a look at American Woodcock from our area data as well. Um, the 2020 and 2021 data which were pre-harvest years, we only de detected one woodcock, or sorry, detected woodcock on one ARU, which might have been one woodcock. But um, however, after the harvests were implemented, detections went way up. Um, just this last year, out of our 24 ARUs, 18 ARUs detected woodcock. And of the 13 ARUs deployed in harvested stands, 11 had woodcock detections. So it does seem like the woodcock are responding well to these small scale cuts which makes sense, the males are using the cuts for their spring displays, and it's likely that the females and juveniles are utilizing the mature forest matrix that surrounds these small cuts. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Josh uh, to talk about some outcomes and future directions of this project. Okay, so um, 
Thanks for the, the presentation there, Reed. So we're going to continue to to monitor this. So before harvest, we summarized uh, abundance, species richness, and diversity. After harvest, we're going to, like I said, continue to monitor that and provide be able to provide our results to you guys within the, the National Forest. <clears throat> Okay, so these um, this method of harvesting is really unique in the fact that it hasn't really been done a whole lot, and it's very uh, it's very neat that we get to be a part of this. And so I'd like to think that we are kind of changing the game with some of the the things that we are thinking about, the way we're looking at some of these smaller cuts. You know, these unique harvests, um, you know, have a lot of benefits. Uh, you know, from a landscape standpoint. Um, you know, we've typically managed Aspen on that 20, 30, 40, 50 acre size. And at some point uh, within those sites, you know, that's probably not super great for rough grouse, whereas having these smaller, more frequent cuts on the landscape is likely going to benefit them. And the fact is that we're still able to meet economic goals or some economic goals while doing some of these smaller harvests. Not just rough grouse, but there's likely going to be a, a suite of species that are going to benefit uh, from these smaller cuts. Uh, they're more likely to, to mimic some of the natural disturbances. I know for a fact that Canada warblers are going to benefit from these cuts. Um, they're already benefiting from these smaller harvests that we're seeing um, in the Chippewa as well. And so not just them, but other species like golden warblers are going to benefit here. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, and the reality is, is that when we look at some of our um, early successional species, uh, you know, we don't always have to default to a forest harvest in terms of providing habitat. Um, Alexis grad student Brett Holland um, is just wrapping up um, some of his master's work and he's showing that some of the shrubby wetlands, um, you know, with some of the management that's gone on in them and just them by themselves are providing good habitat for golden warblers. Um, so that's uh, another uh, management tool that we'll have on our toolbox to think about. And then finally, just a plug here for uh, Minnesota Forestry for the Birds. Um, this is a, a guide that we are working on. There's a whole bunch of partners involved that are working to develop uh, bird-friendly management practices. We've got 18 focal species in the guide that we are uh, working on. And then we've got a couple different forest types that we are are highlighting in there. And so look for that to come out um, and use that uh, resource when you folks are working on setting up uh, harvests and things like that. Um, I think Melissa and Dave Grosich are both both involved in that, that group as well. But that should be out later, hopefully later on uh, this year. So that will take any questions. Awesome. Sharon has a question. Yeah, thanks, Josh and Reed. This is uh, really great information. Um, I was just thinking, so, you know, the sign for the hunter walking trails, I assume that these are open and accessible to hunters, these areas where you're doing the research. Um, is there any concern that hunter harvest of grouse, so I'm thinking rough grouse in particular, might be um, confounding your results? Or do you think it's just negligible? Just kind of came to mind thinking about, thinking about what other dynamics that might be going on there. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a, a issue. But I think for the most part, wherever you're going to find grouse, um, well, you know, doing with the line transects along the, the hunter walking trails, um, it provides just a great opportunity to survey grouse using those hunter walking trail systems. So we likely wouldn't have as good as opportunities to study grouse, you know, in other like, you know, areas that don't have trails. I think the the hunter harvest is probably an issue. Um, I've mentioned in the past, I'd like to, to kind of look more into that and look at how many, uh, you know, whether it's just putting up a kiosk or something like that to have hunters report what they're, they're shooting. Um, you know, one way we could get at that too potentially is using the ARUs to monitor like gunshots and things like that. But th there's probably having an impact, but I think it's it's neg negligible, you know. And it is a system that, you know, we're not going to stop harvesting growth. So it's a system that we do have to work with. I don't know if that helps. Any other questions? 
Yeah, that helps. Thanks. I was thinking you might even be able to, if you thought it was a concern, you might even be able to, like you said, kind of get a handle on what the what the harvest is and what the numbers are of those, you know, grouse that might be being harvested from those areas. So yeah. that's cool. I don't really have a um, question, more of a more or less of a comment, just because uh, it, it's just very serendipitous that a lot of a lot of the stuff is kind of coming to a head all at the same time. But um, you know, one of the big focuses right now, especially in our upland hardwoods, is um, not not only from from an economic standpoint with with loggers and yep. being able to get in there to harvest and, and actually have stand sellable, but also uh, or but also you know try to look at that. I think the study really highlights the the awesome biodiversity you can get from you know more um, group selection type harvest uh, styles, and that that is a um, you know we just did a uh, a record of new information to transition a lot of single tree harvests, things like five hundred acres on Walker over to group selection, um, and so it'd be really yeah I'm really interested to see that. So anyway, not not really a question, just more or less that you know this is a big talking. Uh, point as far 